Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. This episode is a special best of addressing the state of music education. And it features highlights from my hangs with Ronald Rom, Scott Belk, Jose Sabaha, Aaron Rom, James Morrison, Lexi Signor, Mary Elizabeth Bowden, and Matt White. I guarantee you that this will be a textbook example of a highly educational hang. So pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. One of the main purposes of creating this podcast is to give you an insight into the world of trumpet. And there are so many aspects of being a trumpet player. There's the performers, there are the educators, there are the manufacturers, the designers of horns and mouthpieces and other equipment that we use on a regular basis. And each of these components play into the development of the world of trumpet. So the education part is really, really important because this is where our future generation is coming from. And if you're like me, uh, you have had uh, maybe some good experiences with the educational process and maybe you had some bad experiences with the educational process. And I think it's really important that we look at everything in the world, everything in life, and look at what's working and what maybe needs to change. And as our environment has changed, as our technologies have changed, I think that it's important that we look at the educational processes and determine whether they are actually doing the right thing, which is to help to produce a new future generation of fantastic players. So in my conversations, over the uh, the past year and a half of the Trumpet Gurus Hang, uh, I've had the opportunity to talk with many great players, and most players teach, at least teach on the side a little bit. But there are some that make a big part of their career the teaching in a formalized setting, not just in the uh, home studio doing private lessons, but in the university setting. So what I've done with this episode is I've pulled together some clips from my hangs with some fantastic players who are also committed educators in the world of higher education. And during these conversations, a few really important points came up. And I just really wanted to share this, especially as we are preparing for the new academic year here in the States. Uh, this information I think can be inspirational to not just the students, but specifically to the teachers. And uh, if you are catching this at uh, some later date, this is timeless information. So let's start with a very poignant clip from my friend Ronald Rom. Ronald Rom is a phenomenal trumpet player, uh, was a member of the Canadian Brass, one of the original members of the Canadian Brass, and uh, he's also the professor of trumpet and music performance uh, at the University of Illinois at Champaign uh, Urbana. Uh, he has recently retired from that position, but Ronald makes some very interesting points about the importance of not losing sight of what makes music work. I think I think the first thing is that we have to demystify this, uh, the idea of how difficult it is to play an instrument. We have to demystify it and, and we have to get inside the music of the music. So a lot of times we choose repertoire that's too difficult. And we rather, one of the things I like to do is I like to work on, on uh, the fundamentals of what makes the music work. 
And for us, uh, you know, if we, if we, if we talk about uh, Western music, and, and I'm not talking about contemporary music, I'm not talking about third stream jazz, I'm talking about romantic or, or, or uh, classical music or Baroque music, but the, the idea of phrase and shape and, and concept of, of doing the things that allow us to, to be expressive and uh, that's something that's that's not very often um, uh, discussed in terms of, of uh, applied teaching. And I love to just get inside the music with the students and say, okay, where is this going? What what's happening here? Is okay. And and we talk about yeah, we talk about the chord progressions and we talk about the 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 the, the structure, the harmony. The, you got a melody line, you got a harmony line. You got you got you got a bass line. You got you got a rhythm a rhythm rhythm course, and and all of these things all fit together to create an environment, and that environment of the music is our safe place, our beauty place. Okay. And I like to imagine that my studio, for example, when I'm actually in the studio, I've been teaching all since since March here from from this uh, location, which is down in Florida. And I've been doing all my teaching, including my literature course. I'm teaching the literature literature course on, on online. And so it's been really interesting to work with the students and, and to transcend the barrier of the screen and the Internet. And it's really interesting, but the, the the concepts are the same. We need to get inside the music. We need to simplify it and make it beautiful. What makes it beautiful? Well, with with trumpet playing, it's a sound. If you don't sound good, nobody wants to hear you. Okay, <laughs> and so 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 how do we make a beautiful sound? Well, that that reverts to to the fundamentals. It's it's wind in. It's a wind instrument, so it's air in and wind out. So so, whoosh. And how do we make that happen? So we make the we make the lips oscillate and the air vibrates and all of those little details. And those are just the the nuts and bolts. But we know we've got to assemble it, or we got to have to look at it and feel it as part and parcel of a musical line. It starts here. It moves through here. It goes to here. And it goes to there, and then it starts again, and goes to again, 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 and on and on and on. So that's the basic overarching concept that I espouse. And then I also want all of my students to to have a good grounding in a variety of different musical styles, so that when they go, when they get, if they are lucky enough to get hired to go and play uh, in in somebody's section, and it happens to be a salsa band, they don't go stepping in the beats. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> they, they, they feel where the beat is, where 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 the ictus is. If are we, are we on the front side? Are we on the middle of the beat? Are we on the back side of the beat? Are we is is the is the push here? Is the push there? Is the pull here? Is the pull there? What are we going to do? And what does the actual shape of the music have us do with the phrasing? One of the most famous schools of music in the United States is currently called the University of North Texas. It used to be known as North Texas State University. Uh, the North Texas State program, particularly for jazz, was legendary and produced some of the most outstanding trumpet players of uh, the past generation. And one of those graduates uh, is a good friend of mine, Mr. Scott Belk. Scott is a wonderful trumpet player and a dedicated educator. Uh, Scott is on the faculty at the University of Cincinnati, the College Conservatory of Music, and uh, Scott and I had an interesting conversation about how his experiences at North Texas shaped his approach to developing the program and the community that exists at the University of Cincinnati. So let's take a listen to what Scott has to say. Did that experience uh, shape the way that you approach uh, your position uh, at uh, at the conservatory? Oh yeah, really, it really did. You know, um, one of the things that uh, you know, being at a place like North Texas, because the culture is so, I mean, there are a lot of people get out of there. There, there's basically three levels of of attitude towards the place when they get out of North Texas. So people that hate it, that just thought it was just the worst 
experience of their lives. Everybody was a jerk. Uh, the music sucked or whatever. I mean, there's just, there's, there, there are, you know, and I'm not saying they're sour grapes. They just didn't have a good experience with it. There are people, there are very few people that were ambivalent about it. Like just kind of thought, well, it was, you know, good for that or not so good for that. And there are other people that were just like the most amazing place I've ever been to. And you have really strong polarities with a, with a place like that because the environment was so, um, it was so intense. And I, I don't think in a bad way necessarily, it just depends on your disposition for some people horrible for me. It really made me up, up my game. But, uh, but I also realized that I didn't want to, I didn't want to have a community uh, in my school to feel like that, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think it's counterproductive, especially at a small, I'm not a small school by any stretch of the imagination. It's one of the larger colleges. Um, you know, we've got 1400 students in the conservatory. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, but um, you know, we don't have the depth of, of students. So like our best students um, would be at, perfectly at home anywhere at, at North Texas or, you know, the schools in, in New York and, and, uh, or Eastman or whatever like that. And many of them, you know, go to those other schools. Um, but you know, if you, if you look at somebody and they're not cutting it, you just kick them out of the band because they can't play the shout chorus. Um, there's not a necessarily, you know, five guys just as good that we can bring into that, into that situation. And, you know, whereas in, you know, in, in uh, North Texas, there was, you know, I was in the hallway one time and, and there was a, one of the guys in the band who was, didn't want to do a gig uh, from the, for the one o'clock. And, and he was talking to Neil and he said, yeah, Neil, I, I don't want to do that dance. And it was a paying dance, you know, or something like that. And, and, and Neil's like, well, no, we need to do it. It's a fundraiser for the, you know, for the program. And, and the guy was pushing it and he said, yeah, I, I you know, I, I just really don't want to do it. And so finally, you know, you know, Neil was like, yeah, I'll just give me your book, you know, and he gave him his book and, and we never saw him again. He was out of the band. You know, yeah, and he didn't say you're out of the band. He just yeah. was, you know, and and so like that. So sometimes you you wind up with some people that, a lot of people, generations of people that left Denton and tried to do things like that at their small school, their small, uh, you know, liberal arts college in Iowa or their whatever, you know, and that that way of teaching doesn't work. It's like right. it's like being a coach at Alabama versus being you know, a coach in division three, you know, intramurals, you know, or something like that, you know, where yeah. you have, you have to, you have to nurture your students. You have to be able to create an environment that they can thrive in. Uh, and you can't have that pressure. So what happens when you have somebody shows up late a little bit, but they're really great. And, uh, and you want to make the allowance for them, but you don't want to set a, a precedent, you know, you're going to kick them out. What are you going to do? And we have to straddle those, those lines, you know, yeah. all the time. Yeah. And um, it's not cut and dried as, as, as if, if we wish it was, you know, we could say you're, you're late. You know, in the real world, you'd be fired, you know, which is true. But this is not the real world. It's school. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and when you when you look at that, you know, and um, I was listening to a talk by somebody, a lecture, and he was talking about how the American schools are. Um, he had come over as an immigrant or his parents had immigrated after World War II. And he was talking to another friend. They, they'd come from East, uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, he said, the schools over here in the United States are, are not so great. And he said, well, what makes you say that? He said, well, he said in the schools that, uh, and this is in the, from the 50s, he said at, at university, he said, I can, if I show up five minutes late to class, I'm going to get all hell breaks loose. They're going to, they're, they're angry at me. They're, you know, I get, I get a tardy, I get or whatever, you know, uh, but if I get a C, nobody says anything. So, yeah. you know, we look at the professionalism part as necessary and it really is, it's really valuable. And uh, you have to have good work ethic and professionalism, but um, the, it's not because we're factory workers. Um, we have to be able to, do professional work, but the really important part is, is, you know, is somebody getting a C that's not, a, you know, that should be a bigger thing than somebody that can't show up on time in, in an artistic way. Yeah. So when we look at things from that point of view, then we start to think a little differently about how we interact and how we want it. And I think about those things when I direct my band as well. So like, so we might be doing a, an Allington concert or a repertory concert, a Mingus concert or a, 
you know, all different types of things that we, you know, we'll do, you know, specialized repertoire. And I'm never wanting to try to cop the record. I'm not trying to make our performance sound like the record. Um, I understand the value in, in, in doing that, and it's, but it's not something I want to listen to. Yeah. So when I'm in front of my band, the beauty of it is, is I've got a good enough band, um, is that artistically, I can think, what would I like to hear? What would I like to hear if I were the listener? And then I can ask my band to do that. And if my if I've informed my listening and my aesthetics, then hopefully it'll be a, a good product. But I know at least one person is going to like it. <laughs> Jose Sabaja is a phenomenal trumpet player. He is currently playing with the Boston Brass and is on the faculty at Vanderbilt University. Jose, in our discussion, talked about one of the essential points of his approach to the educational process. And that is to help his students to understand that your decisions have consequences. So let's see what Jose has to say about this process and how he applies it in the trumpet studio. I started the studio, you know, because I, I give him a lot of freedom in terms of, of not, I've been given freedom in, 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 in etudes. Mm -hmm. I don't give him freedom in, in, in trumpet technique. I, I give him a lot of freedom in repertoire. So when they choose a piece, and you know, and it does for X Y reason, uh, it doesn't work out for them. And I, I, my first thing to them is like, okay, well, go back, analyze why you chose that piece. Because you liked it. Okay, great. Uh, and why else? Because I liked it, well, then there's the wrong choice. You have to have, you, know, you always have to have to, life is too short. People say life is too short. But with life being that short, there is a lot of responsibility that comes with it. You have to try to kill two or three birds with one stone every time you make a decision, in my opinion. Yeah. So if I start doing long tones in the morning, and I am not paying attention to the long tones I am playing in the morning because I am watching TV or I am reading the newspaper while I do long tones. I am wasting time. Because if I pay attention to what I'm doing, I'm going to be able to take, take a lot more benefit because I am, I'm going to be analyzing the way I am producing the tone. I'm going to be analyzing what kind of articulation I'm using, how much articulation I'm using, how is my air, all of those things. And all, all of that thing applies to what I do on a, on a daily basis. So I think that, that, that um, in, in a way, life is the same way. Every time you make a decision towards something, you have to have, you know, you have to see how that affects in the path that you want to follow. You know, so I, my, I remember what I was going to say at the beginning and then I forget, I never got, I got, my, my clutch got stuck. Uh, <laughs> marketable yeah yeah that was the word i was looking for so if you want to be marketable and you want to have a path that you want to follow um you need to start investing putting money into that that bank account in order to follow that path so if i am playing an exercise like like the clark exercise for the regular things that we do for clack exercise, you know, flow, being able to play in one breath, this and that, blah, blah, blah. I switch the exercise around. And I play slower. I play faster. I play double tongue. I, I, I play as loud as I can. I play really soft. So I have different uses for that exercise. Every, and every time I am doing something with the exercise, I have a, a purpose. That is not only the purpose that is given to me, but I'm looking for a second purpose. So decision making in my life, man, I don't know why it's been easy for me. Maybe not always the greatest decisions, but they've been easy. You understand what I'm saying? We all make mistakes. But I think that had to do with my mom when I was a kid. She was very, okay, you make your own decision. Oh, I cracked my head. Well, you made the decision, didn't you? So... In, in that way, I was very lucky because I was never super 
super my mom was never super protective of me in that sense and that gave me a sense of you know be more aware yeah. of, of my surroundings so it starts with that i i give i i start with the with the with the students that way man mm-hmm. and i i try I, I try to convince them that every decision they make it has consequences positive and negative ones so you they need to balance what it is that that i know i went in a long uh, tangent here man oh no 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 that, that's that's good that's i actually when we hang right yeah, exactly. You know what? I, I I think we must have the same mom. We not only have the same name, but we have the same mom because my mom was exactly the same way. In this next clip, I talk to Aaron Rom. Aaron is the son of Ronald Rom and uh, is a great trumpet player and educator in his own right. Aaron is a trumpet professor at the State College of Florida. And in this clip, we talk about the importance of not just teaching, which is the dissemination of information, but the asking of questions, how the way that we approach things and approach problems have a dramatic impact on our ability to solve them. So in this clip, let's listen to what Aaron has to say about asking the right questions. What's kind of like your go-to strategy for like peeling away those layers of resistance to try and, and, and help a person to, to see the benefit in what you're, you're giving them? Uh, usually I, I rely on throwing things. I'm yeah. kidding. No. <laughs> so, no. Particularly the person, you know, no, that's, that's really. where the martial arts training comes <laughs> <laughs> I like your approach. It's good. Uh, well, I like to call them mind bullets. Now yeah. I, I, um, that, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And, and, and I don't, I, I talk a lot. I realized I was listening to another interview. I, I'm sorry about that, but I guess that's why I'm on here. The, there's, um, I, I recently started diving more into, uh, meditation hypnosis yeah. as well and not hypnotizing other people because you, you get sued for that uh, yeah. or trying to right and neuro-linguistic program right, right. and this right. is all this is all out of out of uh, trying to figure stuff out for myself and so there there is a series of questions that i think we we find are are very helpful for us and a series of questions that when we're frustrated we end up asking ourselves that don't lead us anywhere mm-hmm. right so questions like, well, why does this sound like doo-doo right now? <laughs> you know, that's, that can be a helpful question to us, right? But without more specificity, we don't really know where, where to go with that because that, that could be anywhere. And so like, how could I make this better? Okay, so there, there's at least one positive track we can right. go with that. Right? Mm-hmm. And so for me, it, it ends up being a, a, a matter of finding the, the series of questions for that particular personality that is going to lead them to thinking differently. Not the way okay. that I want them to think, because mm-hmm. that's that's. Ugh. But I think more uh, more along the lines of what's going to lead them to a space where they can actually step away from the frustration, and look at things in an objective way for their practice, right? Yeah. And that's that's the. Um, so yeah, I watch a lot of Criminal Minds to try and figure out people's <laughs> mindset. <right? laughs> but no, I, I uh, figuring out how they react. Right. So some, some people I think can do the really disciplined thing and they, and they, they really need, um, well, at least by my observation, what they, they need to be told what, what it is and not, right. not so much they're self-driven to a point mm-hmm. versus needing that external motivation to, to, you know, put it on themselves. Right. Yeah. Not really external motivation then. Right. But uh, then those who are, uh, I get a lot of this for whatever reason, maybe it's because I, I grew up kind of shy, not kind of like really, really shy. Yeah. And it, and it's taken a big step for me. That's always been the case of uh, like any comments I get back and still occasionally I get comments back for like, if there's an audition or whatever. So like you, you, you really could have played louder. Right. <laughs> so like, okay. Um, it, that to me at this point is, is helpful as a reminder of like, hey, did you really step out? Right. Um, but uh, other other ways of finding those those uh, motivators for that specific person. So yeah, I spent a lot of time observing, um, and, and uh, preferably not, not in a weird way, but observing a personality, right, yeah. of, of how they react, right. And I think again, you mentioned ego a while back, um, and that's such a. I, where does that come in the field that, that we need to protect ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And say, why are you really here for a lesson? 
right? Am, am I going to magically fix anything? It's like, no, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that type of teacher. What I can do over time, when I'm finding the students that stick with me for, for, for years at a time, um, that they, they're developing a, a, that series of questions and being able to look at yourself and, and figure out, okay, am I, am I really doing this or am I kind of um, half-assing it? <laughs> Right. And, and that's, that's nothing, that's nothing new or profound or, uh, or, or groundbreaking that I think is uh, uh, profound in its simplicity. I like that. Oh, yeah, it's deep. Oh, ooh. Poo. That's, poo. That's, that's the, that's the <laughs> Tao poo right there. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. But you know, there, there's a, there's a technique that I used to use now. It's, it's kind of hard to do it on the trumpet. Uh, but I, I actually kind of uh, adapted something that happened in Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery, you know, when he comes out of uh, suspended animation and, and his uh, internal dialogue has been shut down. Uh, the volume of my heart. <laughs> yeah, so I started doing that with, with some of my martial arts students where they were having problems and I kept trying to figure out how do I understand what they're thinking? I, now I had developed a strategy myself where I, I was able, uh, like you're doing voice imitations. Uh, I developed the ability to imitate people's movements. Mm. So, and that, that was a, a tool that I use sometimes when, when someone was doing something, I couldn't figure out how to fix it. I would try to duplicate the movement and then think about what I had to do incorrect in order to get that, you know, so how I do the mind shift. So to try and get in somebody's head, I, I started thinking, well, what are they thinking? What are they actually thinking about? And so I asked them to do the series of movements and then whatever was going on in their head, just spew it out. And there was inevitably the, okay, I'm doing this. I have no idea why I'm doing this. This is the stupidest thing I've ever done. And oh crap, I don't, I, what am I supposed to be doing there? And, and, and you're able to hear those mental processes and you're able to find out where someone has a very clear idea of what they're supposed to do and when it's that. And then I do this and I end up over here and now, and it was just a process of understanding the, the, uh, the, the mechanics of their thoughts. Mm. And I think that I've, I've been transitioned to use that where now I spend, regardless of whether I'm coaching someone on martial arts or music or meditation or, or business, I like to listen to what people say. It's like with mm -hmm. NLP, right? You're, you're listening for the patterns. You're listening for the words because those are what really, those, those recurring patterns. If someone says uh, a specific phrase over and over and over again, unconsciously, then that tells you what their programming is. And then you know how to break it. So um, I think that, that your approach is just uh, really, really brilliant for, for trumpet playing. And, you. Um, you know, that, that it's that marriage of the, the mental approach, the physical approach, the, the spiritual and, and by spiritual, you know, whether you're thinking high power or just that music is something that is just beyond us. You know, we're, we're tapping into this universal energy and uh, to be able to do that and express it is just, it's amazing. So, you know, my hat's off to you for, you know, if I had a hat, my hat would be off to you. Well, for... <laughs> I mean, we, we both say, you know, here, I'll take off my cap. Yeah. Okay, but <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your words. Thank you. you know, yeah. the, I think we, we also get wrapped up in the, the an end result, but sometimes we don't know what that end result is. Right. So I, I have one, one student and this is a lot of my students remind me so much of me, right? Like can't get something right. Can't get something right. Can't get something right. Right. So mm -hmm. what, what does that right? We're talking about that a series of questions. Can you tell me what that is supposed to sound like or sing it? Can you do this? And, and oftentimes with, in response, I get, hmm? <laughs> right. And I say like, so wait a second. If, if you can't tell me what it's, what you want it to sound like, or, it, or you, you don't have an idea of what it, what it should look like. If you're talking about a, a, a form or, or a, a movement, if you don't have a concept of what it's supposed to be or what you want it to be, then you're, you're shoot, you know, you're aiming for a moving target. That's always exactly. elusive. Right. Mm -hmm. So th that I think ends up being a, a, a major, major issue. And, and even for those of us who have been in it for a long time, you know, yeah. without us realizing it just gets even more like so elusive, you know, the, the yeah. hiding in the shadows and, and, and digging that out. And, and, and again, that, that is that, that, 
magic of when when that happens. Uh, it's cool to be there for it. Um, yeah. But if but if you're not, hey, you know, so long as they figure it out. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a special thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like you said, finding the questions and uh, redefining. I, I like to call it flipping the script, you know. So yeah, it's like okay, well, this this sucks, and that's you know you hear that a lot, you know. God, this sucks, <laughs> and no, oh, I say, and then it's like, well, how can we flip that? You know, how can we change? I you know, I think to, I'm in a position to improve myself. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's just that little mind shift that that uh, occurs. So sometimes, no matter how hard you try, you can't buck the system. So what do you do then? Well, if you're James Morrison, you create a new model. In this clip, James Morrison talks about how he developed the James Morrison Academy of Music, which is a fully accredited jazz studies program that he created in partnership with the University of South Australia. So let's see what James has to say about creating a new model. I've, I've been teaching all my life and um... That's mainly consisted for, for quite some time now. Once I started, you know, touring a lot and being on the road, like from, well, virtually from my late teens, that's always consisted of visiting places and teaching. So it's always short term. You come somewhere, you do a, a workshop or a masterclass. Maybe someone asks you for a lesson when you're passing through towns, so you give someone a lesson. And uh, if you're really lucky, you might get to see them twice if you're somewhere for a while. And that's it. Then you move on and you're seeing other people. And that was one thing. The other thing was I visited a lot of institutions and you see some great things. You go, wow, that's awesome. And you see other things in schools and as well-meaning as they all were, because I, I think anyone who's in education is just awesome. But sometimes you think you go, now, if I had a school, I'd do it like this. And you end up with this after years, you end up with a great long list of if I had a school. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm the sort of person that has to then have a school because I, I, you know, I can't, I got to put my money where my mouth is. I can't keep saying stuff like that, even if it's just internally and then not do it. Right. So I guess those two things. One was I wanted to put into practice all the things that I thought would make a great school, having visited so many schools. And the other thing was, I just wanted to spend more than an hour with some musicians. I wanted to spend three years with them and say, come and do a bachelor degree, spend three years. Let's go on the journey for a little while. It's still only a small part of their life. It's only a small part of their musical journey, but it's a lot better than an hour. You know, I wanted to say, let's talk about something. Let's get something going. And then I'll see you again tomorrow and for a few years. So we really get to have a journey. And, and I really wanted to do that and have a deeper sort of uh, role play in people's musical journeys than just arriving giving a workshop and then and then going to the next town so yeah so i started a school about so what, seven years ago oh, so i mean that had to be uh, a tremendous undertaking uh in terms of the things that they had to go through to to have it accredited uh to you know establishing faculty establishing curriculum things like that um and you know the ongoing input of energy that that has to be a part of that um so when when you were in this, did you ever have those moments where you're like, what the hell did I get myself into? Or, you know, did, did that, that passion of creating this next generation or helping to nurture this next generation of musicians, did, did that, that keep you going through the process? Well, it's both. I mean, about four minutes in, I said, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, whose idea was this? But as you say, the passion we go, yeah, well, Nonetheless, that's just a challenge that's been thrown up. And there are lots of challenges and have always been and continue to be. But certainly at the beginning, setting it up, yeah, there's once you, 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 I had this idea having a school means just teaching people music, right? And then, yeah, the whole thing, not just faculty and curriculum, but all the administrative side to that and everything that has to be right around that and all the policies and procedures and like you name it. And so um, it was. I'm not a, uh, what do they call them, a control freak, but at the same time, uh, I'm, I'm a responsibility person. And by that, I mean, if it's my school, I can just hire someone to write policies and procedures, but I'm going to have to read through them all and make sure they fit with my idea of what's, what's needed and what's going to be right and what's going to work um, to realize the vision. I'm a great believer when a person has a vision, they need to follow it through and uh, by all means, get help from all sorts of people. But you've really got to be, you know, you've got to, you've got to experience all of it yourself. And it's a big job. It's a huge job. So, um, yeah, so sometimes it was a nightmare, you know. Um, but um, it's, uh, it, it's the same as playing the horn. Those days when students say, I don't want to learn these scales. You know, you go, uh, what's it for? 
And when you thought about, yeah, but we're going to get to sit there with these young musicians and like pass this on and have this incredible experience. And I'm really lucky. I've got great faculty and all of them do talk about that all the time. We go, wow, we actually get to like spend this time with these people and pass this on. It's, it's, it's extremely fulfilling. Yeah. That's I, again, that, that's such a tremendous undertaking and uh, it has to be rewarding and it has to be frustrating and it has to it, so there's this gamut yeah, of emotions all of those things yeah. <laughs> yeah so it but but that's life you know and i i think yeah. sometimes we we, we want to play it safe we don't want to uh deal with the hardships and the the pains and the struggles but that's part of the human condition and i think to me it, the the things that that have brought me ultimately the most joy in life are because of some of the difficulties that i've had to go through because it just Absolutely. made me appreciate it yeah so that that's wow. I was shown a great thing and I've shown it. I have three kids, three boys. I mean, they're all in their twenties now they're growing up, but, but, um, I showed it to them. It was shown to me uh, just a great life lesson. I, I got a candle and lit it, you know, one night in a dark room and it's magical. I mean, what human being doesn't look at a candle in a dark room and just stare at the flame. And it's just, it's beautiful. And that was it. They went to sleep. And then I said, we're going to do that again in the morning. And in the morning we went outside and we actually went out in the sunlight, it was bright sunlight, and I lit the candle. And I said, how's it look now? And they said, well, yeah, gee, it's weird. It looked so much better last night. And I said, that's because it was surrounded by darkness. On a sunny day, it's hard for a candle to be, you know, to be so mesmerizing. And I said, you know, when because they, they'd been sad about something. They had a, a pet that died. And I said, without, without the darkness around the light, you can't see the light. Yeah. And, you know, the ups and downs. The, and and how, how could you have the satisfaction of seeing someone graduate and how much that means to you when they, when, and when the lights come on, I call it when the lights come on, when someone gets something, that, some concept, some musical thing, that wouldn't be so amazing, so wonderful, so fulfilling if there weren't all the times when they don't or when you've got more administrative work to do, when it's a drag. That's what makes that great. You know, right. so, so, as you say, it's life. Without the struggle, there is no trial. Educational woes are not simply relegated to the world of music education. There are larger problems in the university settings. And in this clip, my friend Lexi Signor, uh, who's a former professor at Indiana State University and currently director of bands at Marion University, talks about the need for a paradigm shift and how it is rapidly approaching. You are so right. You are so right. So, okay, one of my jobs at the university is to teach intro to music education. And in this course, I outline all of the different teaching philosophies and different, um, different ways uh, various psychologists and educators have come to uh, organize the educational art and best practices regarding music education. Almost in almost every lesson, I have to say, okay, even though this is the best practice, even though this research says this, it will probably not apply in your classroom because of this administrative BS. And they, and like my class just goes, but why, why, <laughs> why can't we just do what's best for the students? What? Why is that a not, not an option? No, 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 it's totally an option. I'm just saying that there's going to be an administration uh, an administration somewhere that is probably going to try to get in your way about it. And you're so right that education is broken. And I actually just had this, this discussion with one of my private students who is an aspiring music educator. Um, and we were talking about how the pandemic has really demonstrated to our society at large how broken the system really is when your entire life depends on you shipping your kids off to a teacher to be a daycare person to be a counselor to be a parent to be all of these jobs y'all don't pay teachers enough and i love how when, i love how many people went from oh, teachers are saints we don't te we don't pay them enough oh my gosh uh, this pandemic blah 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 to another shutdown no 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 no! i'm not spending another minute with my kid oh no oh oh isn't that interesting maybe you should have done some parenting in the first place and then that would not be an issue but when you farm out your parenting to people who are not actually parents that's what you get 
Um, so there is that aspect of the broken system. But the other thing about education in this age that we're living is that we've gotten away from teaching what it is important for each person and we the education system at large teaches how to pass standardized tests because the goal of education is no longer to build a holistic like a whole a whole person right for 12 years like it doesn't really matter whether or not you remember the quadratic equation, what matters is can you balance a checkbook? <laughs> you know, yeah. can you can you change a tire and maybe make your breakfast that morning? Like those things have been ripped away from our school system. In the elementary ages, they are taking away recess. It is a fundamental human need to move. It is yep. a fundamental human need to interact and be a part of a community and build friendships. That's what recess is for. <laughs> like and that's that in my opinion is what has has really led education astray is they've taken the humanity out of it mm -hmm. and and i think what this pandemic has really taught us is that when we are given the option to be humans again we thrive and the people that are going out of their way to educate others online or to take classes online whether they be dance whether they be martial arts whether it be science math robotics whatever they are finding deeper human connection in those spaces because they are not, you know, overshadowed by some sort of government entity that says that they have to pay a, pass a standardized test on whatever it is that they're studying. They're just studying because they like it. Yeah. And they're learning from people who like to teach it. Yeah. And I think that is going to be the paradigm shift that completely just changes the way we view education and the way we do education in this country. And I think it's going to happen really, really fast. Yeah. At the end of the day, the purpose of an educator is to provide their student with the best possible chance for success. So why is it that so many people are having problems doing that for their students? Well, maybe it's because the way that many university programs are set up, they really aren't taking into consideration what are the skills that are needed for current and future generations of players. So in this first clip, we're going to be discussing the concept of a practical approach to trumpet curriculum. And this is brought to us by Mary Elizabeth Bowden. Mary Elizabeth is a phenomenal soloist and the founder of Serif Brass, and she's also on the faculty at the Shenandoah University Conservatory of Music. I think what I've been doing in the trumpet studio at Shenandoah is, uh, first of all, building a positive community and, uh, and also having, you know, high standards for improvements. And uh, those are the, the, the most important things. And while I'm building the community, um, like the, during this past year during COVID, you know, trying to, to manage that, all the master classes that we've done each week on Zoom, I've had 21 guest artists. And a, a lot of those guests have been probably half women, many people of color. Um, I brought in some jazz artists for the classical players um, to think outside the box. And so I think that I'm uh, encouraging a lot of versatility and also looking at the standard repertoire of the trumpet and encouraging my students to look outside that because, you know, yes, there are pieces that we should learn, um, major concertos and things like that. But outside of that with famous sonatas, it doesn't just have to be the same set of five pieces that we learn. Uh, there can be other pieces that are brought into the mix that are just as great. Um, and so right now my students are exploring those works and doing some research and trying to find works that have either been overlooked um, or works that have been recently written uh, or writing their own pieces. And so uh, I'm, I'm just encouraging them to be as, as creative as they can to really find their voice. I know for myself personally, uh, my solo career path didn't start until my late 20s. So 
I have a little bit of a different career path. Uh, in my time at Curtis and Yale, I was, I, I believed what I was told that the only way to make a living as a trumpet player was to win an orchestral position. And coming from a place where I had to take care of myself financially, I was like, okay, I better do that. And then I started to see um, what Alison Balsam was doing and Tina Ting. And I thought, oh, wow, these, these women are, are doing this. This is amazing. That's what I wanted to do when I was a teenager. Like, why didn't I even try? And uh, then I, I, try, I did all the steps to restart in my late 20s. And that has brought me on such an interesting path over the past decade, which has been incredibly fulfilling. And I've really found my voice on the trumpets and by finding pieces that I love. And I'm really drawn to vocal music, for instance, and I love finding art songs and I love commissioning new works as well. And I also love some of the old, old pieces too out of a lot of the French repertoire. So I've really found my voice on the trumpet. And so with my students, I want them to start that journey a lot earlier than I did with finding their voice on the trumpet and works that they, that really inspire them and um, to help make their, their, their mark on the world. If that hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, it's, um, it's funny because that, you know, you, you hear that from so many different people about, you know, here are the limitations, you know, and I think sometimes that's, I don't know whether it's, it's our, our desire to be, uh, to protect people, you know, or it's, yeah, you know, I, I don't know what it's from, but you know, the, the thing like, well, you know, you, you, you're going to have to be, uh, you have to win that, that principal chair. You have to win that, that, that full-time orchestra chair. You're going to have to do this. And that's the only way you're going to be able to make a living. And, you know, it, I think that, that things have changed, obviously, um, but sometimes I think that, that teachers have a tendency to, um, in that, that search to protect people, they create limitations uh, without thinking what the person might actually be capable of doing or, um, you know, that, that there may be a different path that they can blaze for themselves. So, w like, when you're... When you're looking back at your career and, and then, you know, being able to take that information and then look at a new student um you know do, are there specific things that you're you're looking at and saying you know hey this person uh maybe this would be a good career path for them being almost like a counselor saying i think this would be a good choice for you i think this would be a good choice for you based on your personality or your uh your aspirations um you know do you have a process that you go through with that well right now especially with the, with the freshmen um I've curated this career packet that I use with Sarah Fratz too, um, where it just gets them to brainstorm what their dreams look like. And with knowing that that can, that will change over time and that's okay. You might think like, I only want to do this now, but then, you know, keeping in mind that you're you, like, when I was 18 years old, I told myself that I would never teach that I have no interest in ever teaching. I just wanted to play. I just wanted to perform. And now it's such a huge part of my life. And I love it. And it's just funny that I had said that very black and white thinking when I was 18. And it's, you know, so I encourage them to think like, your mind is going to change and that's okay. And mm -hmm. so my job is to give them the building blocks so they can become their own best teacher while finding their voice. And so if they're interested in doing orchestral things and jazz, they can do both and learn them both in a very strong way. They don't have to have all the answers right now, but they should be looking for opportunities to grow and try new things. And, uh, you know, I don't think, I really don't believe that spreads an artist too thin. If you're always coming back to fundamentals and being strong in the fundamentals of the trumpets, I think that a lot of things are, are, are very possible. And I found for myself that doing all these different types of solo playing and learning, learning the Brandenburg, uh, for instance, learning the Brandenburg and having that in my warm up makes me a better second trumpet player in orchestra. Okay. It's crazy. You know, it's because of that flexibility of, of being able to do many different things on the trumpet. Whereas when I was in my early 20s and I had my first job in Richmond and I was only playing second trumpet, I struggled with some things on the job. I had trouble coming in on a low G pianissimo. But when I'm playing a bunch of solo rep in my Sarah Frass programs and everything, and I, I'll sit in, I'll go play an orchestra gig for fun over the weekend, 
and play second trumpet and that stuff is no problem. So mm -hmm. I think versatility is very important in becoming and in, in being an artist that can do a lot of things really well. And I learned this through becoming friends with Rex Richardson at my in my time in Richmond, uh, just hearing him. Uh, I don't play any jazz, but of course he's very versatile. He can do like anything. Right. And then he would come and play like third or fourth trumpet in Richmond Symphony and sit next to me and just have this phenomenal low range. And that to me was like, oh my gosh, it's possible to do other things right. than to just be a second trumpet expert or whatever. You can do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And so hearing Rex do that and my friend Jose Sabaha, hearing him do that kind of stuff too, was like, wow, like people told me that you should just do one thing. And I, I just, I believe that's not, that doesn't work for me. I need to be doing a lot of things to sound my very best. Yeah. Well, you know, that that's one thing that I've kind of learned to embrace uh, as I've gotten uh, older and hopefully wiser is that when you can look back, when you when you use retrospect, um, you can see how all these different things that, that at the time seemed to be disconnected, they actually can come together to make something that's, that's really unique and really, really great. And it was when I started to, to look for what I call the golden thread through the things that I do. So whether it's music or uh, martial arts or uh, consulting or all the different things that I do, it's like, well, what's the common thread? And the common, my, my common threads are that I, I, I'm passionate about learning. I'm passionate about the thought process, the mindset that people have and what it takes to, to be successful. And, and I, I start to look at all the, the things in my life and go, oh yeah, okay, well, these are the common threads. So everything was working together to get me to where I am today. Um, and I think sometimes we get too caught up in what the actual technique that we're using at the moment is, as opposed to thinking about it in a, in a more holistic and a more whole, uh, like a, a global perspective. So uh, I really like what you said though, about uh, having that career path thing, because I think that so, so many people missed out. I know for myself, I missed out on that when I was a, an up and coming a college student, you know, it, it would have been really nice for my professor to sit down with me and to really, talk with me about what my aspirations were and help me to, to experiment with things and to, you know, to, to, to see the big picture as opposed to, well, if you're, a, if you're a music major, these are the things you have to do. Boom, boom, boom. And you know, there's no room for argument and there's no room for personalization of a study program. Yeah, I agree. And I'm having them all next year. I'm going to have like a resume building class and writing your bio and getting the, getting your headshots and just like those, those basic things just to know how to do them. And so you're not just like where I was at age 27 of like, I don't have anything. I don't have a website. I don't have photos. Like, what do I do? And then I gathered those things. Um, but I think if students can be start learning what they need now, that stuff is always evolving and changing every year as it should. Uh, and another interesting thing that, that students have now that I didn't have when I was an undergrad uh, is how to navigate social media. Yeah. Not to show my age or anything, but when I was their age, you know, it was like MySpace, okay. which was not for your career, which is fun. I'm like, I don't know if you were on that platform. I loved it. Um, yeah. But so we've seen the development of all, the, all these things and how to utilize them. And I somehow fell into it. Instagram, it, like I seem to communicate really well with people on that platform. And I'm, I feel comfortable with it because I'm able to share not only just trumpet stuff, but I, I'm just really honest about my life. And I think, and people feel really drawn to that. I get a lot of messages from people I don't know writing, how come you haven't posted a picture of Duke, my cat? How, where's Duke? I don't see him. Uh, so yeah. I, I just, I think that's cool to, that we can share our personalities. And so my students, I encourage them to share what they're comfortable with now as being students. Um, you know, obviously you don't have, not everybody has to share if they're not ready, if they're still a student, but some of them, my students are very, uh, my three freshmen especially are very outgoing with kind of sharing their practice accounts and things like that. And, and I think it's, if it's health, I, I encourage students that if you feel like it's healthy for you right now to do it, go for it. If you wanna wait, that is totally fine too. And uh, so I think that's just an interesting, so we, I, I, want to help them build their pages and think about how they're 
communicating with their audience over time because I think it's a very it's very fascinating to see what's I mean I'm sure the platforms in 10 years will be completely different right. and I can't even imagine what they're going to look like but it's going to be different and yeah being, but flexible is, is is really important I think now, this final clip is brought to us by Matt White. Matt is the chair of jazz studies at University of Southern Carolina. And Matt and I had a really great hang. And particularly, we seem to resonate on this concept of ditching the dogma. Uh, that The fact that so much of the current pedagogical approach to teaching trumpet uh, is trapped in the ritual and the traditions and not leaving much room for growth and expansion based on changes in technology, changes in the music scene itself, and, and what are the skills that are actually necessary to be a full-time working professional trumpet player. So this is a, a little long one, but there is so much great information, and uh, I'm sure that you're going to enjoy this as much as I did. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what you're saying like resonates with me because for me, the most important thing is problem solving, right? And if, if anything, like that's what my I want my students to take away from working with me is not like, oh, I learned to do this specific thing or this specific thing is like, I had a problem musically or even in life, right? I had an issue and this is how I came up with a strategy to get better, you know? So if you if you sound bad on the bridge to a tune, like how do you practice it to get better? If your time's bad, how do you get better, Right. Um, if your ears are bad, how do you improve that? And so always thinking about that. And that's, I think, where the creative creativity and practice comes back to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in academia for a while now. And I think one of the things that's, um, you know, the, these ideas of like a, adhering to dogma, they don't serve the students and they don't really serve us as teachers. Um, and so for me, having the ability to look at a problem and not just say that this is the one way to fix it because this is the way I was taught or this is what my teacher told me. It says, have, see a student struggling with something and go like, well, what if I explained it this way? What if we tried this, right? And, and, and for me, um, you know, bringing it back to trumpet is, you know, my, my early teachers were mostly like Adams from like the, the Bill Adams school, right? Right. But even then, like seeking out other things just to be like, could this help my students, right? Like, let me learn a little bit about Caruso because, and Lori Frank, because maybe that'll help my students, I don't buzz on the mouthpiece, but like maybe I should read the James Thompson book so that it, maybe there's something there that'll help my students. And so I think any kind of dogma you get into is, is, is pretty dangerous and pretty limiting. Um, and, and I think the other big thing for me with, with education is helping us to get out of this idea that, you know, education obviously in academia moves really slow. It's slow to make any changes. And as somebody who's worked in it, it's really hard to get people on board with new ideas. Um, but, you know, getting away from this idea that, that students can only be, you know, one of three things. They can either perform, teach, or compose. And we know as people that have worked in the industry now, like, that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. Most people have four or five things that they're doing and they're piecing together a living. But if we don't tell students that, they go into the world and they think like, well, I have to get a job with an orchestra or I'm dead in the water. Um, and so for me is like, first of all, helping students understand that that's not the case. And then going back to some of the stuff we we're talking about earlier is being really open, you know, and to saying like, you know what? Yeah, I love playing the trumpet and I love playing maybe traditional jazz, but maybe I like hip hop and maybe I can, you know, be a producer. Maybe I can make tracks for people. Maybe I can be an arranger. Maybe I can have a small studio of like 10 to 15 students and piecing those, those things together. That's what gives you like a fulfilling career in music. It's yeah. not just doing one thing. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a really important concept and, and it's been kind of a recurring theme, uh, both in, in the interviews that I've been doing recently and just in, in general in, in my life and, and the things that are going around around me. Um, it's the, you know, what is it that you're really trying to accomplish? I and mean, what is this really important to you? That question, uh, you know, is it being a trumpet player? Okay, well, if, if if that's the most important thing to you, then don't limit yourself to saying that you can only play, mm -hmm. you know, classical gigs. You can only play big band gigs, or whatever. Playing the trumpet, if you if you love playing the trumpet and you want that to be your career, then play everything you can, anytime, anywhere, 
just do that and be happy with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't limit your options. If it's to be a musician, well, then that's a different thing because being a musician can be, like you said, you know, you can be playing your horn or it can be producing tracks. You know, it can be, you know, engineering can be a lot of different things that, that are part of, of that process. If it's about creativity, well, then creativity can express itself in so many different ways. You can write a book, you can, you know, so it, it's like really getting down to answering that fundamental question. What is the most important thing to you? That foundation thing that, that, that really gives you juice. Uh, and then, look for as many ways of expressing that concept as humanly possible. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, I tell my students this all the time, but if your goal, when you go to college uh, for, to study music, let's say, if your goal is to do one single thing, you're really missing the point, right? Your job when you go to school should be to become a great musician and have all these different experiences. You know, if, if your job, if your outlook is to be, you know, the greatest lead trumpet player, on the planet will like save your money and go take lessons with Roger Ingram or Wayne. Right. Yeah. Like those, that, that would be a better use of that time. So all those things that students complain about, and I complained about them too, you know, going to theory class, learning class, piano, going to ear training, music history. Those are all ways to build your musicianship. Right. And they, and by building that musicianship, you're kind of, you're looking at it and you're going like, wow, I can be comfortable in a bunch of these situations and I can figure out a way to be successful. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's it's really interesting. Um, I, I had a great talk with uh, James Morrison, uh, previous episode, and he had a really interesting take on theory and uh, in the way he teaches it. He said, you know, most people want to teach theory first mm -hmm. and then apply it. He says, you know, he wants to teach application first and then help you to understand the theory as to how and why it works to, to give you a better a better sense of things and i think you know in in terms of the way our education system particularly music is set up that sometimes we put the uh the application side of things secondary and you know it's like okay well the first thing is we we need to make music let's make some music you know let's play the horn let's sing let's do this okay now let's get under the hood and come to a deeper understanding of it. But it the the theory should be what gives us context for what we do. Right. And and that's that's what theory is, right? The whole reason is so that when we play music or we hear music, we can have a deeper understanding of it. And we get so disconnected from that. And you know, the the difficult conversations that teachers and like people that are, you know, in in the, the business of teaching music need to have is like how, how are we best serving our students, right? How are we making our students successful? And anytime a conversation goes back to, well, this is the way we've always done it, or this is the way I've, I've you know, I learned it, so everybody should do it this way, like, I'm out. Yeah. Like, that, that's it, because, you know, we're, we're getting away from the point. And, you know, if, all right, so if writing four-part Lutheran chorales is the best way to learn voice leading, okay. But like, let's have that conversation because most of our students, when they come in, have no idea what a four-part Lutheran chorale is, right? So maybe there's a different way that we could teach them voice leading, um, you know, how, how harmony moves uh, horizontally. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really into having those conversations. And for me, a lot of times, it's just like when people tell me, like, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and this is why I have tenure, which is good because I can say this now. And I go, why? Why are we doing this? Why? Yeah. And again, if, and if, we, if we say we're doing this because we think this is the best thing to teach this to our students, cool. That's a great conversation to have. Yeah. Well, and I think you hit, the, the, you hit it right on the head with that why. Because I think that's, that's always the ultimate question that we have to ask ourselves. You know, why am I doing this? And I, when you get to that kind of, uh, well, this is the way it's always been. Yeah, like I, I'm with you on that. It's like, okay, well, that's that's the the kiss of death as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, because that means that, that you're not open to new possibilities. You know, you're yeah. you're looking backwards and not looking forwards. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 part of that is, you know, we have to take the responsibilities of people teaching it. Is we have to keep educating ourselves. We yeah. have to be, you know, we have to we have to be listening to what's going on. We need to be observing what's going on, and because. If not, which is what happens in a lot of schools, we're giving our students a picture of what music was like 30 years ago mm -hmm. or, you know, even longer. And if we're not at least somewhat connected to what's going on now, we're not really helping them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you know, and I've had this conversation with a number of uh, people who are involved in academia um, and, and in teaching in, in other aspects. Um, what is it, like, if you had to put your finger on the, the one thing that you would want to create a change in, like, you know, you're given the power to, to make this, this massive shift in, in the way that, that music is taught, what would be that, that one thing or that one critical skill that, that you feel uh, would make the hugest difference in, in the way music was taught? Yeah, I think, I mean, it'd probably be a couple things, but I think the big thing for me is prioritizing rhythm. Um, you know, because so much, so many of my students, they're taught, and this is like, this starts early in music, by the way, this isn't just like in college, but they're taught to prioritize pitch and pitch correctedness, right? Mm -hmm. And, but we know that most of the music that makes us feel good, makes us feel good because the, the way that the rhythm feels and the pulse. And so, so many students come into school and they either don't internalize a pulse or if they internalize a pulse, they can't make the next step, which is kind of the mechanical use of it on their instrument. And so like things I've had ideas for is like, what if there was what I call like a rhythm class? And just like you go to like ear training your first semester, you go to theory one, you go to a class and there's like a master drummer that's just playing a groove. And you learn to play with that groove. You learn to subdivide it the different ways. You learn to subdivide it in twos and fours and threes and feel those things. And eventually you start taking your instrument and making those rhythmic things happen as well. So I, I think for me, that would be the big thing is like prioritizing rhythm. And then also, I mean, this is, this is like a, a hot button topic that people talk about all the time, but like, you know, why is written theory three credits and ear training is one credit in most theory curriculums, right? Because we know the ear is the most important tool. That's what we use to listen to music. And so why are we prioritizing looking at the music as being a more important skill than actually being able to hear the music? So I think those would be like kind of my two big foundational things. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, let, let's, let's take this a step further. <laughs> I'm going to go uh, down rabbit yeah. hole. <laughs> okay. Uh, hopefully this doesn't screw with your tender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no, the president's already signed it. So I think okay. I'm good. I think you're I'm good, solid. You're, you're, yeah. all right, solid. No, um, I mean, obviously, there are there are these needs in terms of of uh, the practical skills of of a musician, but I think there there are some other things that are missing, and particularly you know, someone like you know, you've you've got experience not only as as an educator but as a performer. Um, but there, are, I think there are some serious life skills that I th that are missing in terms of the way that we structure our curriculum. Um, so if, you know, you here, here again, uh, Matt White gets to create his own ideal, uh, music curriculum, uh, at, at his university. Um, what are some of the other things that you would want to see as requirements as, as, uh, as requisite, requisite studies that, uh, are kind of overlooked in the educational process that, uh, you know, we're kind of left to, to flounder and learn on our own sometimes, uh, the hard way. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and, and this is like something I'm actually already doing at my new gig. I'm getting ready to take over as the chair of jazz studies at the university of South Carolina. And so we're already looking at like ways that we can improve the curriculum. Um, and so for a big one for me is entrepreneurship, right? Every, every young musician should look at themselves as a startup business right? Because what is your product? You're, you're promoting yourself. And so, you know, some of the things that I think that are really important with that is like knowing how to do your taxes, right? How many of us have had to do our own taxes and been like, what? Like, what's a mileage log? Wait, I can write that stuff off, right? So I think that finances, um, we talk a lot about like what I call like career maintenance, which is not something I have to do as much now because, um, you know, mostly I'm a teacher. But when I was a freelance musician living in Nashville, I had like a two hour block every Thursday morning where all I did was what I called like career maintenance, which was like emails, phone calls, following up with people, reaching out to people. Because, I, you know, I think what you're saying too is like relationships is like the backbone of what we do, right? So like no, being available, being cool, being agreeable, having all those skills that you're just assumed to have, those are all things, but we don't teach that in school. Um, so I, I think like kind of those business elements are things that I think that every student needs to be taught. And I think the other one is, is inter interfacing with technology. Um, 
you know, I'm getting ready to make a class where like literally the whole class is learning how to track remotely and then send people files for projects because, you know, it was something that was happening before and I was certainly doing it a lot. Um, you know, cause I, I live in kind of the middle of nowhere in South Carolina. Like I don't, there's no big studios nearby me that can go track. So I'm doing it all in my little office here. Uh, but having the ability to, you know, arrange and stack a horn section from home and then be able to send the files correctly to clients. I mean, th this is just stuff that like everybody has to be able to do to be able to edit your own tracks. And so those are all the things I think that I would like to see kind of, um, you know, th th these being like the assumed skill sets that every musician needs to have. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Um, you know, I, I know, you know, you obviously could, could, you know, become a music technology major, you know, uh, you know, so yeah, there, there's that thing, but I think that, that for any performing musician, there should be, um, a level of experience that they, that you have with the technology side of things, you know, uh, I think back to to my schooling, and this was, you know, back in the the very early '80s. Um, you know, th there were no real classes for, uh, you know, how to, how to deal with with sound issues. You know, you know, and, and when you get when you get on a gig, uh, you know, unless you're at the top of the the heap, which no one starts at the top of the heap, you know, we're all, you know, climbing our way up. Yeah. You know, you're, you're doing club dates, you're doing, you know, small things. And, uh, you know, you don't know how to deal with sound reinforcement issues. You don't know how to deal with mic placement. You don't know how to do all these things that, you know, maybe a, a tech major would know. But, uh, you know, as a player, I think it behooves us to, to understand, at least on a, on a cursory level, how to, how to set up a mic properly, how to, you know, how to, to set up a basic monitor mix, you know, how to deal yeah. with EQing and things like that. And how to communicate with the people to get what you want, I think, is a big part of it, too. Right. Because uh, there's always that contentious relationship between, like, the performers and the sound person, Right. Mm -hmm. it's like ah it sounds awful and i'm miserable but it's like also it would help us if we could say like hey you know could you roll off a little of the highs starting at 2k in my monitor right and to make me happy and to make me feel like this is actually what my trumpet sounds like and that's good information for a sound person or you know i mean how many times have you gone to like a college or high school jazz band concert and like a soloist starts playing and they're nowhere near the microphone right and like the big band director has to like take the microphone and like move it over to the soloist but like why don't we practice that? You know, and and so like, even with my trumpet students, like I'll just put a dummy mic next to their stand in my office, and I'll be like, practice how you would play on a microphone for this, okay? And if you're moving around, I mean, if you're getting into it, that's cool. But understand that now you're making the sound person's job harder because they're having to like ride the gain to to because you're not staying on the microphone. Um, so these are all things that we can integrate into our teaching. We just have to kind of think about them and and, and be open to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's super, super cool stuff. Um, with, uh, with your studio, um, you know, how many, stu how many students do you have currently? Uh, well, right now my, the studio that I'm leaving, cause I'm getting ready to switch gigs, but right now in my current studio, um, at Coastal, I had, uh, nine students, nine trumpet students. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, w with those students, um, you know, it was there like a, uh, a specific demographic that you were dealing with? I mean, was it, uh, you know, uh, people that were more interested in, in uh, performance, more in education? Yeah, I mean, I, here we go back to those, those standard categories that we- Yeah, we, I mean, sometimes yeah. we just have to make categories whether we, we like it or not. Yeah, but so uh, the, that program, we had um, what's called a commercial music and jazz major, which was like an undergraduate degree that I kind of built from the ground up. And that was about half of my trumpet students. Um, and then a couple of ed majors. And I think I only had like two, what you would consider like traditional um, trumpet performance students. But, you know, one of the things that was really important to me was to try to kind of, and, and, I've, and, and I'm always learning. And so there was plenty of failures along the way and there, there will continue to be. But, um, you know, having an idea of like a trumpet curriculum in the studio that actually is reflective of a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. So, you know, I had a student, for example, do their jury um, this past semester where they played the first movement of the Hindemith concerto, but they also had to play the, um, the horn parts from like superstition and um, sing a song. Okay. Right. Yeah. And everybody has to do some improvisation. 
And even if those aren't those specialties, because to me, like you were saying earlier, like most of us end up doing club dates or wedding gigs, like these are things that you need to know. Yeah. And not only the things you need to know, but like you could learn something about like clean articulation by actually playing superstition clean, right? Yeah. That's, that's something that you can learn. And so that's kind of the way I've, I've approached in terms of, of teaching the studio is kind of making sure everybody's got a very balanced approach. And then if they have things that they need to really specifically hone in on, we'll, we'll hone in and on those just a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we're, like we were saying earlier, you know, being able, if you want to be a trumpet player, if you, if you, if you want to play trumpet as many, in many, uh, situations as possible, um, you know, there, there are certain things that, that, uh, are your standard repertoire, but it's probably not going to be, uh, you know, the, the Hummel or the Haydn or, you know, uh, any of any of those classical things, unless, unless, you know, you're doing, you know, the audition circuit, uh, you know, you're going to be playing, uh, if anything, legit, the thing you're going to play the most might be uh, trumpet voluntary. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and, you know, how about getting good on that? Uh, how about, uh, you know, learning, learning those bodacious uh, licks, uh, earth, wind and fire kind of licks like, uh, you know, September, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, it drives everybody nuts, you know? So, okay. You want to practice your articulation, your double tonguing. Okay. How about, how about playing, uh, playing this lick? All right. How about right. And, and you could off, you could argue that that's, that's just as an effective as useful as like learning concert etude. If you're learning how to like multiple tongue or cleanly articulate something. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love kind of thinking about it coming from that perspective of like, you know, what are the things you're going to have to do? Like, yeah, if you ever have to call, if you have to uh, play a wedding ceremony, like these are the tunes you're going to need to know. Can you play them? Um, you know, approaching learning the piccolo trumpet from that perspective of like, okay, let's learn the wedding rep first. Yeah. Because this is the stuff you're probably going to have to play. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, going back to my martial arts days, <clears throat> a lot of times people would ask me like, hey, well, what's the practical application of this? I'm like, well, okay, I can, I can show you all these different concepts, but you know, Ideally, especially because I, I taught a lot of Tai Chi, it's like, you know, okay, well, the, the, the most practical application of this is that it's going to keep you from uh, falling down a flight of steps. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's going it's <laughs> to help you to understand how to deal with uh, an aggressive personality uh, as opposed to, you know, this is how you break somebody's neck with, with something like this. Uh, because practical just means that it's, it's useful. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it serves a purpose and, uh, I would rather look at, at what am I going to use something for most consistently? You know, what's the thing I'm going to, I'm going to have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, not the thing that may happen one out of a, a thousand times, you know, and sometimes I think that's what we tend to do, uh, is we focus on the, the what ifs as opposed to the, the, what is most probable, uh, and, and I think for, as a trumpet player, there, there are, uh, yeah, I, I would love to see a new standard repertoire be developed. And, you know, like you're saying things like, you know, superstition, you know, September, um, and the wedding, the wedding repertoire, uh, you know, the, the, the star spangled banner, you know, for, for goodness sake. I mean, how many times are you going to get a call for doing that? Taps. Oh you yeah. Know, just, just the stuff that, you know, Hey, if you were really good at doing these things, you could actually make a, a fairly solid living as a as a working player yeah and i think also using repertoire as a way to address an issue in your playing so that you feel comfortable on other musical situations right as opposed to saying like we're going to learn the hummel because there might be a time 15 years from now you get to program it with a with a band or something right and instead of looking at it as like okay what is this thing teaching me that I'll be able to apply in other situations. Cause ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to make ourselves super comfortable on anything we're asked to do. Right. right? It's the same thing with ranges. It's like, well, why do we want to have a good upper register or great endurance? And so when we get called for a gig and we have to use those things, we're not freaking out. We feel like we can do it. Um, and so I, I think all the, all the teaching should be oriented in that way is like, what skill sets am I building up so that when I get called to do something and they throw a piece of music in front of me, I'm like, I got this. Yeah. All right, thanks for sticking around for this episode. And I hope that it not only inspired you and educated you, see how that works out, but that 
it gets you thinking about ways that we need to and can change the educational process to ensure that the next generation of trumpet players is put in the best possible position to keep the music alive. So thanks for joining me for this episode and I hope that you have enjoyed it and also have a little bit of food for thought. Make sure you continue to support the Trumpet Gurus Hang by subscribing to our YouTube channel and supporting our sponsors. And as always, peace and slide grease. We out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of valve oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm-hmm.